Hey everyone, it's uh, Pastor Brian Ross from uh, Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I'm going to be doing my eighth and final video for now on the issue of the King James Bible in America. As you know, on September 24 and September 27, uh, Pastor Rodney of uh, the church in Connecticut did a uh, critique of my book, The King James Bible in America, in uh, a two-part uh, video study that he did, one from his house and one to the uh, saints in his assembly. And I've been addressing that here. So far, there are seven videos. This is the eighth and the final one that I'm going to prepare for now. So what I'm calling this is concluding thoughts for now. I actually am not going to play a lot of Rodney in this particular video, just a, a brief segment. And then I want to kind of recap and walk everybody through some of the arguments and some of the reasoning. So let's start by listening to the last segment uh, of Rodney that I'm going to actually play. I have all of the links here. I've shared all the stuff in the comments so uh, so as not to be accused of hiding anything or anything like that. All the pertinent information is available in the comments. In a lot more detail and you know, by yesterday, I thought, man, I got like eight hours worth of material here. If I go, th if I go through all of this stuff, but you know, we understand what he said. You know, dictionaries, you know, for him are important. I understand the King James Bible. For me, they're absolutely not important at all. So I didn't do thoroughly. I did not do establish, but I can promise you. So I just, I do want to make a comment on that. Rodney says dictionaries are not absolutely not important to him at all, yet his entire case in both videos against my book, The King James Bible in America, has been based on the Oxford English Dictionary. So everything that he has said is based upon his selective use of the Oxford English Dictionary, as I have proven uh, ad nauseum in the previous uh, videos. So if the dictionary doesn't matter to Rodney and he doesn't care at all about it, then I, I question why he's basing his entire argument on it. So he's selectively picking what he wants and then applying the selective definitions to the King James Bible and then acting like the King James Bible is proving all of this of, its, of itself by itself alone when that's not what has happened as I've demonstrated in all these videos that the same thing that's true about the words that we did look at is also true about those words also. They are different. And the translators of your King James Bible knew something, enough about the Greek and the Hebrew to recognize the sense of the word and the meaning. It doesn't matter that establish is used in one verse and then it's establish is used in what seems to be like an absolutely similar verse. Because... There are, just like example and then sample, it can be said of establish and establish the same kind of, same kind of differences, okay? Now, I, I, you know, I'll tell you this, okay? I'm done talking about this subject in connection with Brian's book, okay? I'm done talking about this subject in connection with, with, with his book. When I bring up the subject of words in the future, it will be in connection with this book. It will be in connection with the King James Bible. And I think, and I'm pretty sure that in my preaching over the years, I have tried as much as I can to edify the body of Christ with a word of God that they can rely on, that they can trust, that they know is leading. Sorry about that. My printer decided to go off there. Them from this life into the next life with no questions in their mind. And it's a word that I believe with all my heart is forever settled in heaven. I actually think, and some of you may laugh at this. 
So I uh, accidentally made a mistake and started playing that at the wrong spot. But a few minutes before that, at the 1 hour, 11 minute and 41 second mark, Rodney takes the Bible and he takes the book, I should say, my book, and he makes some statements about how he questions that when he read my book, he had these questions about, can I really trust my King James Bible? Should I get an NIV? Should I get a modern version? And then he says something to the effect, if you if you read the book, saying to the audience, if you read the book and you didn't have those questions, well, good for you, but you don't have the same eyes that I do. So I want to say and respond to that and just say many people have rejoiced to uh, read and learn the content presented in my book, The King James Bible in America. Um the book in no way insinuates that people should replace the King James Bible with a modern version or that folks can't trust the King James Bible. The book never says that. In fact, if you read the introduction, I am very clear about what I believe about the King James Bible. This book is clear about that for from the start. Reading from page four, I say, First, I am unequivocally a King James Bible believer. I believe the King James Bible is God's word for English-speaking people. God inspired his word and preserved it throughout history. The King James Bible is a formal, equivalent, literal translation of the preserved text into English. As such, I maintain that the King James Bible and its underlying texts are inerrant in all uh, they re are inerrant, excuse me, in that they do not report anything about God's person, nature, character, creative acts, redemptive acts, or dispensational dealings with humanity that is false. In my, it is my position that the King James Bible contains all the correct readings and is without error in all that it reports. That's what it says in the book. But Rodney wants to cast doubt on whether or not the book really affirms the uh, superiority of the King James Bible. Okay, The book was written to address... A what I perceive to be is a weakness in the argumentation of the pro King James position. That's why I wrote the book. I did not write the book to call into question or raise doubt or anything. It was to address the way the position has been articulated and enunciated in some ways that I think are not in line with the facts and objective evidence. Okay. Let me also say that years ago, before I published the PDF version of what would ultimately become the book, I submitted the manuscript to a group of prominent grace preachers and pastors, as well as other grace brethren, for their review and comment. So the book was published by Dispensational Publishing House here in uh, 2019. Before that, it was a PDF uh, essay on our church's website, gracelifebiblechurch.com, and before I even did that, I submitted the paper to uh, a, a bunch of different folks for them to review and to get their comments on. And I'm talking prominent pastors within the Grace School of the Bible uh, sphere of influence it, are the folks that I sent it to. I'm not going to say who they are. It doesn't matter. Many of them, the, the reaction was somewhat mixed. Many of them rejoiced to know the content that was presented in the book. That would be some of the pastors and the other brethren that I sent this to, uh, who I, who are studious brethren and are you know students of the Word of God, rightly divided in the King James Bible, who aren't necessarily uh, pastoring, but whose opinion about the Scriptures I, I value uh, and and hold in high esteem. Others offered some feedback along the following lines. So in that peer review, the two somewhat uh, areas of critical response that I got were number one some unclear comments about connotation and the denotation of words. The idea, well, the dictionary might define it this way, but the connotation and the denotation of the words are different. Um, the statements that were made along those lines, I ultimately found to be uh, unclear, and I couldn't follow uh, what those brethren were saying. Second uh, order of the second line of uh, critique that was given by via the peer review is that the dictionaries don't have the final say as to the meaning of words in the King James Bible. There is a chapter in the book that I did title What Sayeth the Dictionary, where I went through all the different words and showed what they mean, very similar to what I've done in this series of videos. Okay, so to 
So that was another comment, the idea of the built-in dictionary and the, the King James determines the meaning of words in the Bible, not dictionaries. An example that was given was uh, end sample and example were given uh, as examples of this based upon the prefixes. So understand the particular brethren that are were objecting to uh, the use of the dictionary submitted examples uh, of their objection along the lines of the prefixes ex and en on example and in sample. Um, so I asked those brethren and I said, well, I, I said, well, how do you know that that's what the prefixes mean? And they responded by telling me, well, the dictionary says so. So to me, that is completely circular reasoning. You cannot say that the dictionary doesn't define words in the King James Bible. And then when I ask for an example, you give N sample an example. And then I say, well, how do you know what those prefixes mean? And then they respond by giving me the dictionary. That's that's not going to work. Um, that, that, that's not going to work as an argument, and it doesn't prove the built-in dictionary concept. Now, the built-in dictionary concept, I still say, all right, where is there a verse in a King James Bible that says that the King James Bible has a built-in dictionary? There isn't one. And Rodney himself in recent teachings about other topics, you know, has, has uh, made a big deal about there not being verses for different things. First Corinthians, you know, about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Yeah, that's the principle of Bible study that we use. But that doesn't mean that the King James has a built-in dictionary the way that Gail Ripplinger and those who agree with Gail Ripplinger have asserted it to exist. So appeals to authority are not arguments. Appeals to authority are not arguments. In the video, Rodney says, well, many other grace preachers agree with me. Well, of course, many other grace preachers agree with Rodney because Rodney is espousing the traditional view. The traditional view amongst pro-King James grace pastors has been to say, as Rodney has argued in his critique, that these are different words and that they have different meanings. I have, through my study, come into question with that idea, and I don't think that that's true. So, of course, there are some folks, uh, many grace preachers, maybe even more than not, who are going to agree with that. But here's the thing. That's an appeal to authority. An appeal to authority is a logical fallacy that suggests that I'm right because of how long I've studied something or because of all these people that agree with me. Okay. How much time or how many people agree with somebody, how much time or how many people agree they spend studying a given subject doesn't determine the accuracy of the validity. I mean, the majority of Christendom rejects the King James Bible as God's word for English speaking people. The majority of Christendom rejects dispensational Bible study and the distinctive message and ministry of the Apostle Paul. Hours spent studying error don't make error correct. So my point is, any argument that is based upon appeal to authority, based upon how much time one has spent studying of something a particular way, or how many agree, is not proof. It does not prove an argument to be true. And there were quite a few appeals to authority along those lines in Rodney's videos. Now, in my estimation, Rodney's critique of my book fails for a host of reasons, okay? Reason number one is the use of logical fallacies, such as appeals to authority and the false dichotomy that Rodney established and then used throughout the videos to pigeonhole and mischaracterize what I actually believe and what is actually taught in the book, all while he is saying that he's trying to be fair. Now, there are instances of fairness that Rodney has, which I noted in the videos, but there are also instances of extreme mischaracterization. So lumping me in, Rodney created the dichotomy between the new school of higher learning and the old school of hard knocks. And he talked about my education and the fact that I went to college and that I have a master's degree and that he didn't. And he creates this dichotomy between these two things. Then he proceeds after that to specifically lump me in with James White and Dan Wallace. This is an absolutely incorrect inference and mischaracterization. 
And it's offensive uh, for a brother to do that. Um, and many grace believers who agree with what I've argued in the book have contacted me very upset about Rodney's mischaracterization. Remember, at one point, he actually says anybody that agrees that these three words mean the same thing, he questioned their salvation immediately after talking about James White and all this sort of thing. So if there, the, that, that particular mischaracterization and that false dichotomy argument, that logical fallacy um, is not going to work. I'm also aware through the Grace Grapevine of folks who are saying that because I wrote J.C. O'Hare, The Origins of the American Grace Movement with a former professor of mine, Dr. Dale DeWitt, that that automatically means that I am in agreement with DeWitt about textual criticism and modern versions. Um, that is absolutely not true. That is absolutely not true. I do not agree with the critical text. I am not a modern version advocate. I am a preserved text believer and a King James Bible believer. So these types of false dichotomy arguments, whether in Rodney's video or other ones that I'm aware of that are being made as sort of a, a, a insinuations to undermine the book, are just not, they're just not accurate, they're mischaracterizations, they're offensive, and they're not fair. So Rodney also used, so first you have the, uh, the reasons why the argument, Rodney's argument fails is number one, the use of logical fallacies. Number two is the use of imagined stories. Rodney's fictitious story about this event between this exchange between uh, translator John Spencer and Abbott about the words example and end sample, unless Rodney has documentation that he has withheld from his audience, is a complete fabrication and an imagined event in Rodney's own mind. He offers no evidence, no documentation that such an exchange ever occurred. And he offers it as a way to say that in the preface to the King James Bible, so let me show you right here, in this discussion about uniformity of phrasing where they're talking about particular words, uh, it says right here, but that we should express the same notion in the same particular word as for example... If we translate the Hebrew or Greek word by purpose, never to call it intent. So Rodney uses the fictitious story of John Spencer and Abbott as a way to undermine the translator's own principle that they set forth in the preface. Rodney says, well, I don't believe for a second that they're talking about end sample example, thoroughly, thoroughly, established, established, etc., Yet when we search it out, we realize that they are following in, in, in those cases, particularly in establish, establish, um, always, always an end sample example. They are all coming from the same Hebrew and Greek words. They are used interchangeably, as I've demonstrated many times over in this series. Third reason why Rodney's argument fails, folks, is what I'm simply calling dirty dealings with the dictionary. Rodney intentionally withheld information from his audience and did, that did not accord, did not square with the version of reality that Rodney was presenting in his critique. He specifically highlighted, select, and picked which definitions in the OED he was going to show you. And I would add to that, that Rodney did that with my book in front of him which gave the full entries from the OED for all of the dictionary definitions. There is no way that Rodney didn't know what all of the different and various definitions were because he had the OED in front of him and he had my book in front of him, which gave all the information uh, necessary to be able to make such a decision. And I have a question about in the category of dirty dealings with the dictionary. Why is Rodney even using a dictionary? He says that you don't need a dictionary to define these words, yet he is in basing his entire critique of my book on a mischaracterized and misrepresented presentation of a dictionary, the OED. What about the built in dictionary? I thought that we didn't need a dictionary and that we were supposed to be using 
uh, the built-in dictionary. And here's the real thing that is lost in this. When this conversation started in August, because of the videos that Scott Ray made on end sample and example, Scott Ray said plainly, he said very plainly, here's the quote. It's a word study on end sample and example because there's a difference between end sample and example. If you listen to certain other people who think they got to go to the Greek or the Oxford English Dictionary, they're going to tell you the wrong definitions. I use my King James Bible, stayed with the context, and I derived my own definitions for the words. So I created, so, so Scott Ray is saying, what, what is Scott Ray saying? He's saying that the dictionary is wrong and that he came up with his own definitions for the words. So I in, responded with a video. Um, let me see if I can find it. Let me just um, bear with me here for one second. So I responded to these comments from Scott Ray with my own video on, um, let's see, what's the date for this here? September 13th, entitled uh, Thoughts on Recent Discussions about the words end sample and example, where I presented the fact that using that methodology, the methodology that Scott Ray is identifying, that different King James advocates have come up with four, at minimum, four different definitions. I talked about how those who want to argue the prefix argument don't even agree about what the uh, different words mean. And so my point was, and the point that I seem to have uh, landed, even though nobody is acknowledging it, is that this idea that the dictionary is wrong and that deriving your own definition is completely subjective. It's completely subjective to the individual opinion of somebody without any uh, external objective verification. But now we find Rodney in his critique of my book using the dictionary. So what happened to the online? selectively engineering definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary and then selectively applying them to the King James Bible to present the perception that the King James Bible is defining the words this way, when in actual fact and reality, Rodney got the definitions he's using from the Oxford English Dictionary after he said that you don't need to use a dictionary, okay? He claimed that dictionaries have changed the meanings of words over time. Listen, dictionaries do not change the meanings of words over time. Dictionaries record the meanings of words over time. The meanings of words have changed. The meanings and spellings of words have changed over time. This is a fact. This is an absolute objective fact that cannot be disputed. The, Rodney claimed the dictionaries intentionally changed the words. No, that's false. The dictionaries merely record the historical meaning and usage of the words along with their spelling merely record, they merely record the changes in spelling and the word usages over time. So Rodney's arguments failed because his critique fails uh, for the use of logical fallacies, the use of imagined stories without evidence, clear object, clear dirty dealings with the dictionary. And the last one I would say is just vitriolic language. I mean, Rodney, if you evaluate the videos, it seems to me that Rodney thinks if he just says something with enough gumption and authority that he can like just make people believe things just through the force of the way that he says things. It just doesn't work. The all all of the arguments that are presented in the book, in my mind, are intact. All right. So let me talk about that for uh, a bit. In my book and these videos, I, I have presented a case. I present an argument of cumulative force based upon objective evidence, objective, verifiable external evidence, not stories and imagined things, not undocumented things 
not selective use of the dictionary selectively applied after we're not even supposed to be using dictionary. So I, I don't I don't understand what that's about. My argument is an argument of cumulative force based upon verifiable objective facts, which includes, number one, an honest and complete presentation of the Oxford English Dictionary. Again, I have to reiterate, Rodney had the book in front of him that had all the dictionary entries from the OED reproduced, and he had a copy of the OED in his own library that he highlighted, screenshotted, pinned the pictures he wanted people to see without giving them all of the information. So factual, my argument is based upon number one, an honest and complete presentation of the OED. My argument is also based upon the oldest known English dictionaries. I anticipated this idea that the Webster's 1828 dictionary was 200 years removed from the King James Bible. So I actually did research and going back to find the oldest known dictionaries possible, all right? My research is based upon this information. Here is the table alphabetical from 1604. This is the same year King James authorized the translation, all right? Um, my evidence went, we looked at the, uh, the Middle English Dictionary that looked at the meanings of words uh, in Middle English between the... Um, Norman invasion of Britain in 1066, and the modern English period starting with William Tyndall in the 1520s. We looked at the Middle English Dictionary. I showed you the online entomological dictionary that talked about the word origin of words. We looked at this dictionary here, the, uh, the table alphabetical from 1604. We looked at Glossopedia uh, from Thomas Blunt in 1656 a new world of words by edward phillips from 1658 the universal entomological english dictionary by noah bailey in 1721 and a dictionary of the english language by samuel johnson in 1755 all right i showed you dictionaries going all the way back that were all saying that these words are variants of each other and that they are synonyms they were confirming everything the oed everything that the total complete and honest representation of the oed was claiming to be the case, all right? We looked at the pre-translational history and word usages in the English Bible, all right? I showed you, I showed you all, I showed you end sample and example. I did a complete collation going all the way back to Wycliffe and going all the way to the King James of, of how these words were used. And you can see that it is very interesting and it confirms exactly what the Oxford English Dictionary says. We looked at that for end sample and example. We looked at that for establish and establish. We looked at the, whoops, that's not what I wanted. I based my argument on the preface to the King James Bible where they say that they use synonyms that, and that if a Hebrew and a Greek word, uh, that they would use synonyms to translate those words. I presented the textual facts uh, in the preserved Greek text, the Textus Receptus, and I'll, that, that they're translations of the same Hebrew and Greek words. Um, and again, I have to say, does the preserved Greek matter or doesn't it? It's not going to work to say that the preserved Greek is the basis for our ability to identify the King James and the, and the, the Texas Receptus and then say it doesn't matter now when it comes to the translation. The fact of the matter is, is that in Romans 1 and Romans 16, it's the same Greek word. Paul wrote the same Greek word, and that Greek word was preserved all down through time from the first century till today. And the King James translators just render that word using two different English synonyms, exactly like they tell you in the preface. So my position is based on the textual facts from the preserved Greek. My position is based not on imagined stories about Spencer and Abbott, but on the notes of an actual translator who sat on the final review of the translation process, the Reverend John Boyce. These are his notes on 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, where he explicitly says 
uh, more than once and uses the word example there and example there in a in his comments on a verse that the text said and sample. And then he says that verse 11 is completing the thought and he's referring to the thought that started in verse 6 where the King James has example, not in samples. So there again is verifiable objective evidence from a translator, not made up stories that are undocumented. We looked at a comparison of different editions of the King James Bible. We looked at, here's, here's what I showed. This is Genesis chapter 11, verse 3, about thoroughly and throughly. We looked at different edition, comparison of different editions. Um, of the King James Bible, and then we based I based my position on different printings of the King James Bible in America. Here's the Matthew Carey the the Matthew Carey's text from 1813, and here is the American Bible Society text from 1819. So my position is a position of a cum of cumulative force based upon objective facts. Let me recap. An honest presentation of the OED, the oldest known English dictionaries, the pre-translation, the pre-1611 translational history and word usage in the English Bible, the preface to the 1611, the textual facts based upon the preserved text, the notes of John Boyce, cross-references within the King James Bible, uh, comparisons between different editions of the King James Bible, and the printed history of the text in the United States. So my position, <coughs> excuse me, is an argument of cumulative force. So if, if one is going to say and maintain that the, that the position that I have set forth in the King James Bible in America and the videos that I have produced in response to Rodney, if, they, if you're going to say that it's false, they must logically do the following. Number one. They have to, my position has to be falsified based upon objectively demonstrating where it fails factually. So you have to go through the preponderance of evidence that I have laid out in all the different categories that I just listed and show where what I've said does not accord with the facts and it fails factually. Now, this cannot be done based upon the subjective defining of words and private interpretation. This cannot this cannot be based on this type of thinking that says the dictionary is wrong and you can derive your own definitions from the text. If that's true, that leads to ultimate subjectivity because anybody can come along and define anything the way they want to. And there is nothing to stop them from doing it. You could argue the context, but if that's true, I've just showed in these videos four different King James advocates, all defining end sample and example differently, supposedly arriving at those definitions based upon the same methodology. So if, if my position is wrong, it has to be falsified by objectively demonstrating where it fails factually, not based upon subjective defining of words and private interpretation. Second, somebody has to erect their own positive case to replace mine based upon objective facts and data, not subjective and private interpretation. I've heard one preacher say that the dictionary says that the words mean the same thing, but they don't mean the same thing in the King James Bible. Folks, that confuses what a translation is. A translation sets about to take the donor language and render it in the receptor language using words in the receptor language that communicate what is said in the donor language. The idea that a dick so magically take on unique and distinct meanings simply because they are in the King James Bible is dangerous. It's dangerous. The King James Bible is not intended to be a dictionary of English words. It's not. The extent that a word can be defined in the King James Bible occurs because it's God's word, and that's what God's word does. 
God's word does that in any language that it's translated properly into because that's how God inspired his word. But the King James Bible was not designed to be an English dictionary. An alternative, so let me recap. So number one, my position needs to be falsified. Number two, a positive replacement position needs to be erected based upon objective facts, not subjective interpretation. And thirdly, an alternative position must accord with the mid acts Pauline dispensational understanding of the scriptures. Double inspiration. The idea that God inspired Paul in the first century and then he inspired the translators in the uh, early 17th century, that is that can work for an Acts 2 Baptist defender of the AV, but not for a mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalist who believes in the sufficiency of the scriptures and maintains that revelation and inspiration ceased when the word of God was complete. When Rodney says things like, when God put those words in his King James Bible, he is insinuating some sort of extra divine act. Scott Ray flat out says that in one of his videos, that the Holy Spirit superintended over the process and led them to make these decisions. Folks, that is, how is that any different from our teaching against charismatic confusion when it comes to the sign gifts and all of that sort of thing? So an alternative position, number one, has to falsify the one I've presented and show where I have factually misrepresented the case in all of the categories that I laid out. Again, those being um, honest uh, complete presentation of the OED, the oldest known English dictionaries, the preach 1611 translational history, the preface to the 1611, the textual facts from the preserved Greek, the notes of John Boyce, the cross references within the King James, and comparisons of different editions of the King James and the printed text in the United States. All that has to be falsified and wiped out. In its place, a positive uh, argument based upon objective facts and evidence, not subjective private interpretation needs to be replaced, and whatever that is has to accord with the mid acts dispensational position. Now, let me say, this entire discussion cuts to the quick of what we believe about preservation and the King James Bible. Let me show you, okay? So here is the gain carry text. This is all laid out in detail in the book. This text from 1813 was pre this exact text from 1813 was previously published in 1803 and before that in 1792 by a guy named Hugh Gain. Matthew Carey bought the standing type for Hugh, from Hugh Gain for his edition, all right? Now, so this is 1813 and this answers to 1792. We're talking about the inception of Bible printing in the United States after independence was secured. So here is the text of course, I have an error now that I tried to make it bigger. Hang on a second. Let me try to fix this. <clears throat> okay. Again, this is the Matthew Carey text from 1813, which answers to 1803, which answers to 1792. Here's Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Now, we watched in the last video, video number seven, Rodney talking about how it can't be thoroughly because uh, then there would be no brick left. And I explained that and showed you folks that from this, here's the 1611, it said thoroughly. And here's the 1760, or, sorry, the 1769 said thoroughly and the 1769 said throughly. But here we have an American edition from here. It's going to give me trouble. So I already showed it to you. But we have an American edition now saying thoroughly. Here we have the uh, American Bible Society text from 1819. And if you go to so notice, this is the ninth edition of this text. And if you come down here, by the way, I should add that Matthew Carey text, this one here, this Matthew Carey text that you can't see now because it's giving me trouble. According to Rodney's argument, 
Rodney's argument would require the falsification of all 60 of those because it has thoroughly, not throughly, in Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. Folks, that is the necessary logical implication of that particular viewpoint. Let me show you now the American Bible Society text. And again, I'm having trouble with it loading and so forth, so I'm just going to get out of it. But guess what the American Bible Society text has in Genesis chapter 11, verse 3? It has thoroughly, not throughly. Folks, between 1881 and 1888, the American Bible Society printed more than 32 million King James Bibles. 32 million King James Bibles were printed by the American Bible Society. These Bibles were taken all around the world by American missionaries, and all of them possess orthographical variants like the one I was trying to show you here. Let me see if I can get it to work here, and maybe I can. I don't like it when folks have to take my word for things because that's not the way it should go. Genesis chapter 11, verse 3, and they said, go to, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Of these 32 million copies and editions put out by the American Bible Society, all of them possess ortho orthographic variants in how they spelled words, okay? This number, this 32 million number, doesn't even include the millions of King James Bibles printed on other presses in America during the 19th century. Here's the thing. A consistent and logical application of Rodney's position and those who agree with him requires the falsification of millions of King James Bibles because of orthography and how certain words are spelled. Doing that would functionally deprive generations of Americans, American Christians, of God's word because they don't have the correct edition. That's what this book is ultimately about. But Rodney didn't talk about that. I question if he even read the second half of the book. But do we really want to falsify millions of King James Bibles because they spelled it thoroughly, not throughly, when the dictionaries and all the evidence that I presented in the last video clearly demonstrate that the words mean the same thing. There is no substantive difference in meaning when accurately understood from an honest presentation of the Oxford English Dictionary, okay? If we're going to falsify this because of this argumentation presented by Rodney and folks who agree with Rodney, then all of these King James Bibles need to be falsified and discarded because of the way they spell some of these words. I cannot accept that because of Psalm 12, 6, and 7, where God's word is going to be preserved from this generation forever. There is no evidence that American Christians in the, in the 19th century thought or believed that they had to have an Oxford or a Cambridge, Cambridge printing in order to have the pure word of God. The position that is being enunciated here in critique of my book is extremely dangerous to the King James position on the whole. There is no reason to falsify these millions of Bibles um, because orthographic variants are known and understood within the printed history of the King James between 1611 and 1769. So let's come back over here to the internet and let me Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Notice here, and God said, let there be light. Notice how B is spelled, B-E-E. -E. Then you come down here, and it talks about uh, the day from night, and let them be. The word be is spelled two different ways in the same verse in a 1611. Now, is anybody going to say, oh, well, these are two different words? That's absurd. What this shows you is that there's no standard orthography, okay? Let's go to John chapter 3. Let's go to John chapter 3. Let's look at verse 16. John 3, 16. Notice what it says. It says, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So notice how only is spelled. O-N-L-Y. Drop down with me to verse 18 and look at it here. Okay? 
Uh, where are we at here? Is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only. O-N-E-L-Y. Well, these clearly have to be different words because one has an E and one doesn't. No, that's absurd. That's just showing you unsettled orthography in the English language. Look at John chapter 3. Look at verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthy and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from the heavens is above all. Notice, two M's here, one M here. Well, these obviously have to be different words. No, they don't obviously have to be different words because they're not. Look at Matthew chapter look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 verse 23 and Jesus looked Jesus looked round about them and saith unto his disciples uh, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God K I N G D O M E E at the end. Look at the very next verse and his disciples were um hard to make out some of these words because of the font but look at this to enter the kingdom of God. No E. E on kingdom in verse 23. No E on kingdom in verse 24. I mean, clearly these have to be talking about different kingdoms. I mean, because there's an E on one and not an E on the other. That's about as that's about as logical as saying that establish and establish have to be different words because one has an E on the front of it and the other one doesn't. My point is this. Orthograph, orthographical differences and change are known and understood by the pro-King James position between 1611 and 1769. So if, if an American publisher, if an American printer changes the spelling of a word to spell it the way it's spelled in America and spell it thoroughly instead of throughly, and the words clearly mean the same thing, this is not a substantive change to the text. And if it is a substantive change in a text that everybody that read this, you just falsified their King James Bible. These are King James Bibles. These are not NIVs. These are not critical text versions. These are King James Bibles that are printed in the United States. So the pairs of words in question are spelling variants, not wholly different words of discriminated meaning. American printers conform the text to American orthography. This dictionary, which I'm not going to be able to pull up, so let me type it in. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, notice what it says. American Dictionary of the English Language. Webster's Dictionary is recording how English words are used and spelled in America. Okay? So when this dictionary says for throughly, when it says in the entry for throughly, for this word, when it says here, just waiting for it to load, when it says in this entry, so for throughly, for this word thoroughly is now used. All it's saying, folks, is that's how that word is spelled in the United States. So if an American edition spells it this way, this is not a substantive difference in meaning. How is this, how, is, how, how are these spelling changes any different than what happened in Britain between 1611 and 1769? Now, I'm not calling for unending revision to the King James Bible. If you think I'm saying that, you are misunderstanding me and you are putting words in my mouth. I am not calling for that. What I'm simply saying is we need to think long and hard about these American editions. And this is what first caused me to question this. So there is no compelling factual or scriptural reason to falsify millions of copies of the King James and thereby deprive generations of Americans of God's word in English. There's no reason to do it. I don't know why we would want to do this. Why would we adopt this position? My position, the position of my book, the position that I have argued in these videos is a position of least damage. 
It's a position of least damage, which acknowledges that there are facts about the King James Bible and its printing in the United States that we have not known here, that we heretofore have not known. And so the traditional teaching on these words was not aware of the factual evidence that I am presenting in the book and in these videos. But once we're aware of this factual evidence, it is far more damaging to the pro-King James position to say that we're going to toss out millions of copies of the King James Bible because of how they spell the word throughly. My position is a position of least damage. It does the least amount of damage to the pro-King James position, and it brings the pro-King James position more in accord with the objective, verifiable facts. Do I need to go through the list again? The dictionaries, the notes of John Boyce, the textual facts, the preface, the printed history of the text between 1611 and 1769, the American printings, etc. Okay, If Rodney's position is correct, that he needs to, if Rodney's position is correct, then logically he must tell us which edition of the King James Bible is the correct one to the exclusion of all others. Because even as I showed you within the, seven, the 1611, 1769, the words thoroughly and throughly are changed four times and two times they are horizontal changes both ways. So if Rodney is right and his position is correct, then either the 1611, either the 1611 is errant or the 1769 is errant. They cannot both be inerrant. My position is a position of least damage. So in conclusion, I'm not trying to undermine or lay aside the King James Bible. I'm not trying to do that at all. I'm not trying to lay it aside in favor of the critical text or modern versions, but I'm rather trying to put forth a more accurate articulation of the pro-King James position that does not outstrip the historical facts, the, the historical and textual facts. It doesn't have doesn't do us any good to have a position and rhetoric that can easily be damaged by somebody that has a better command of the facts. I am not willing to take the King James Bible that my American forebears possessed and say, I showed you the, the Bible in, in the first study. I showed you the Bible of my grandmother, or sorry, Becky's grandmother that changed the spelling of words. I am not willing to adopt a position that hangs our current textual and translational debates upon bygone generations of Americans that knew nothing about what we are currently arguing and debating with modern version of critical text advocates. It's not fair, and it's ahistorical to do that. So until somebody can falsify my position based upon a better factual understanding and show where my position does not accord with the facts first and erect their own positive position based upon facts and objective evidence, not privately defined words and uh, subjectively defined words in private interpretation, that thirdly is in line with the mid-Acts Pauline dispensational understanding of the scriptures, that revelation and inspiration have ceased. I'm going to stand with what I said in my book. I love the brothers involved here. I don't agree with them. And I, I'm, I'm imploring them to strongly consider and think critically about these things. I know that I'm a 43-year-old upstart and that these there are brethren that I love and I preach with that I have the utmost respect for who are older than me, who are in, who have the traditional understanding of these things. We have let go of traditional understandings on so many other things and issues related to dispensationalism and the grace life and God's working in time. There is another element of tradition here that I believe we need to let go of. I pray that we can have honest dialogue and discussion, but based upon my evaluation of Rodney's attempt to critique the book, the book still stands the argument still stands. 
It's not contrary to the King James position. And I think it needs to be strongly and prayerfully considered. The, we cannot adopt a position about the King James Bible that treats it superstitiously or like it's a magic book that just because a word is in the King James Bible that it can somehow take on a meaning outside of what the word can be proven to have meant. That is dangerous to me, and I have a problem with it. I'm going to sign off, and I'm going to hope and pray and encourage everybody to think critically about these matters. Thank you.